don't see back in the waiting room. Nope, hold on. Getting a few more here. Good morning, everyone joining us. We're gonna get started in just a few minutes, so please hang in there. Hey. Hi, Beth. How are you? Good, how are uh, you doing? I cannot turn on my video, so somebody will have to allow me to do that. We'll make you a co-host. Sorry, I was in a waiting room. <laughs> all right. <laughs> we didn't know you were no in a waiting problem. room. Apologies. Try your video again, Beth. Yeah, all right. There we hey. go. How are you guys? Good, how are you doing? Good. That's great. Thanks for helping us out today. Yeah, of course. This is fun. This is fun. It's a fun topic. Yeah. Yeah, it's fun to talk about something a little different from what I, I don't usually just talk about plants. So it's good. Excellent. Jordan, are you good on slides? Yeah. Yeah, we okay. just, I'm leaving them how you, how you put them in originally. So we'll go okay, through cool. that. Yeah. All right, no problem. And um, are you advancing slides? I'm yep. assuming, yeah. Okay. I've got the presentation. I'll, I'll run that. Yeah. We've got a couple people joining us, and I'm sure more will join us here, and we'll get started in just a couple of minutes. For those joining us this morning, if you want to put in the chat where you're coming from, um, wherever you are in the watershed, we welcome you to our chat about native plants. And add your favorite plant. I love seeing whenever people, it doesn't have to be native, we won't judge you. Just add your favorite plant and where you're from. <laughs> where is, okay, let's see. So Jordan, if you were to add your favorite plant, what would you add? I think it would have to be Columbine. It changes on a monthly basis, but I very much enjoyed the Columbine this spring. So that's great. What about you, Kate? Oh gosh. Um I'm really loving uh my black eyed Susans right now. Mm. I can't wait for them to bloom. They're they've like taken over my garden. I'm gonna have to divide them next year. <laughs> Excellent. Great. So Bryant's in Arlington. He likes red bud trees. That's a good, good favorite local tree. Thanks, Brian. All right, we got folks jumping on here. We're gonna give it one more minute just to let a few more people jump on, then we'll get started here. Doris's favorite plant is uh, beard tongue. Great, welcome, Doris. We've got Virginia, Pennsylvania. If you're uh, just joining us, if you want to put in the chat where you're coming from this morning, and if you want to share your favorite plant, we'll certainly be covering a lot of them today, I'm sure. All right. Well, why don't we get started to honor everyone's time this morning. I want to thank you all for joining us. Um, for those I have not met, my name is Kate Fritz, and I have the honor of serving as the CEO of the Alliance for the Chesapeake Bay. And I want to welcome you to our Breakfast on the Bay series. This is our first talk in a new series that we are launching this summer. The Breakfast in the Bay series is a signature talk that celebrates the companies, communities, and conservationists who live, work, and play in the Chesapeake Bay watershed. So this year, the Alliance is celebrating our 50th anniversary. It's five decades of bringing together communities, companies, and conservationists to restore the lands and waters of the Chesapeake Bay watershed. So the work that we do is in four program areas, including agriculture, forests, green infrastructure, and stewardship and engagement. And we do our work in two parts. First part is through convening diverse voices to discuss challenges and solutions. 
and then leveraging resources to implement those solutions on the ground for cleaner water. As an organization for the last 50 years, we've held true to our values. We value collaboration, wherein we partner across sectors and regions to achieve a larger collective impact. We work inclusively. Um, we are partners who de demonstrate integrity and amplify diverse voices for an equitable impact. And we drive with data to promote informed action and hold ourselves and our partners accountable for measurable impact. Our work takes place across the 64,000 square mile Chesapeake Bay watershed. And our work is focused in Annapolis, Maryland, Richmond, Virginia, Washington, DC, and Lancaster, Pennsylvania. So also in addition to our Breakfast on the Bay series, we are, uh, celebra as we're celebrating our 50th anniversary, we're bringing 50 stories to life. 50 stories which feature individuals, projects, ideas, places, and partnerships representing five decades of restored lands and waters of the Chesapeake Bay. And I think Lauren's gonna throw a link into the chat so you can access those stories and take a walk down memory lane with us this year as we celebrate our 50th. So if you are joining us from Zoom and you have any questions throughout the event, please click the chat button at the bottom of your screen the chat box will open and here you can send any questions or comments you have and we'll make sure those get to our presenters today. Lastly, I really wanna thank the donors who have made this talk possible. Our 50 years of on the ground work would not be possible without you. If you would like to become a donor, please visit allianceforthebay.org backslash donate. Just $5 a month can make an impact on the most productive estuary in the United States. This summer, we have a generous $25,000 match donation that is matching all donations up to $25,000. And I hope you'll consider making a donation to the Alliance this summer so we can continue to do our work for the next 50 years. If you're interested in other Breakfast on the Bay talks, please visit our website and to see a full list of events and registration links. We've got a lot more coming up this summer and we hope you'll join us. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our Breakfast on the Bay session this morning about native plants. So as rain washes chemicals and fertilizers into our streams and rivers, and ultimately the Chesapeake Bay, we know that our waterways are uh, polluted and that pollutant fuels the growth of excess algae, which clouds the water and threatens the health of the fish, crabs, and the entire Chesapeake Bay. One of the easiest ways for us all to reduce our pollution contribution to the Chesapeake Bay is to replace some of our lawn and typical landscapes with native plants. Today, we welcome Jordan Gulkenauer, our DC Green Infrastructure Projects Associate, and Laura Todd, our Green Infrastructure Project Manager, and Beth Ginter, the Executive Director at the Chesapeake Conservation Landscaping Council, to learn how you can utilize native plants in your yard, at your office, and all around the watershed. So without further ado, I will hand it over to Beth to get us started. Welcome, Beth. Hey, good morning, Kate. Um, thanks so much. I'm actually gonna let um, Jordan kick off the slides, but I'll just do a quick word of introduction um, and say thank you so much for inviting me to join you. Um, my name is Beth Ginter. I am a landscape designer by training um, and I love talking about native plants. So I'm very excited to have the chance to chat with you this morning. And uh, I am the executive director of CCLC, uh, which is a nonprofit organization that focuses on um, providing training and education for landscape professionals and the public across the Bay watershed. Um, so I will let Jordan go ahead and jump into some slides and um, I'll be right back with you in a few minutes. Thanks, Beth. Um, I'm Jordan Gochnauer. Um, as Kate said, I work in DC with the uh, River Smart Homes program. Um, I've been doing native landscaping in DC specifically for uh, eight years now. Um, so work with a, a lot of plants that are native to the Chesapeake Bay. Um, so in this presentation, I'm gonna explain why we use native plants, why we value them, um, what a native plant is. Uh, how we can determine what's native and what isn't, because it can get very complicated. Um, so we've got some great resources for you there. And then Beth is gonna give you some great examples of very specific plants that are gonna be applicable to anywhere in the Chesapeake Bay um, that can be used with great success throughout the watershed. Um, can everyone see the presentation this is presenting right? Looks good on my end, Jordan. Thank you, Kate. 
All right, so why native plants? Pollinators, birds, wildlife, we always talk about it because it's very important. Without the natives, the insects, the birds, the, the local wildlife are not gonna have the resources they need to eat, to shelter themselves, to find protection from predators. Um, these are plants that are absolutely essential uh, to maintaining a healthy ecosystem. Deep roots. This is a very, very important uh, feature when talking about stormwater management. So native plants have much deeper roots than some of the non-native alternatives. So when you're looking at capturing water, stabilizing slopes, soaking up standing groundwater, there's really nothing better than native plants. As you can see in this illustration, you have the hydrangea on the left-hand side, and that is a non-native variety of hydrangea. And the roots aren't even as deep as just buffalo grass. Um, so really it is, very important to be planting native plants. This is why we like to replace lawn with native plants because you can see the lawn, the grass there on the left-hand side, barely below the surface. There's very little root structure to that. You put in a native plant garden, and that's going to soak up so much more water. It's going to be able to get down into the much deeper layers of our soil, um, really impact the ground in a way that lawn just doesn't. There are reduced maintenance costs for native plants. It does require less water. They can grow to outcompete weeds. Um, now, this isn't to say there are no water requirements, no weeding requirements. You know, every new plant still needs to be watered. Um, but the native plants are going to take a lot less once they're established, once they're fully grown in. Um, whereas some of the non-natives, especially annuals, you have to water them constantly. Um, so yeah, less maintenance. All right, so this is an example of why it's so important to have natives. And I'm going to talk about cultivars here a little bit. Beth is going to go into what cultivars are, what's a good cultivar, what's a bad cultivar. She's going to go over that later, so I'm not going to over explain it right now. But essentially, on the left here, you have the native turtle head on the bottom. That's the white turtle head. Uh, Galabra. Oh, my lens, not great. Um, but on the top, the top picture, the pink turtle head, that is a cultivar. Now, the Baltimore checker spot, its primary uh, habitat where it likes to lay its eggs, is on the white turtle head. It really doesn't like laying them on the pink turtle head, and it's because the leaves, the color and texture is completely different. Um, I like to say it's like if someone went onto your computer and they shuffled your desktop and they changed the picture. If you sat down on your computer, you would probably be like, wait, is this my computer? Even, you know, it's the same structure, but the picture is different. It looks different. Um, so yeah, it's really not the ideal habitat, even though it's, it's the same plant, it's just a different cultivar. So we really like natives and a lot of our our native species, especially endangered ones like the Baltimore checker spot, really rely on these native plants. All right, so I've been talking about native a lot, but I haven't really clarified what that means because a lot of these plants are native somewhere. Um, I like telling the story of a client who she showed me uh, the tag of one of her plants. She said, well, this was sold to me as a native and it was grown up in Pennsylvania it was then sold out in Virginia and planted in DC. So sure, it was native somewhere. Um, whether or not it was native to DC is a totally different question. And again, I'm, I'm saying native to DC, but that's not really the best way to talk about what's native um, because it's about an ecoregion, which is a, an, area, an area that has common traits, uh, common geological features. Uh, this is a map of the ecoregions within the Chesapeake Bay watershed. You can see uh, DCs labeled right here. That is in, it's a combination of ecoregions actually. That is your Piedmont and coastal plains. Um, so something that's grown up in Pennsylvania, up here in the Valley and Ridge, it might be okay here, but maybe not because it's adapted to a higher elevation, a cooler weather, 
uh, cooler climate, bring it down in DC, it just might not do as well. Um, so when looking at natives, we want to look at where it's growing best, um, what ecoregion. That's going to be a better way to talk about it than based off artificial state borders. Uh, so we've got a poll for you. Um, looking at this picture, uh, let's identify what ecoregions we are in. Now, I'm in Silver Springs. That's up north of DC. Um, you can see DC's right here. Up north is 64. 64 is the northern Piedmont. And we were unable to fit all of these into a Zoom poll. Apparently, there's a 10 option uh, maximum. So if you don't live in any of these that are uh, the options, feel free to type that into the chat where you're joining us from, what ecoregion you are in. Looks like we do have a lot of Northern Piedmont. Um, that's a lot of Maryland, so it's a good place to live. All right, we'll give it another couple seconds, then, then we can close down this poll. All right, let's wrap it up there. Um, so yeah, knowing your knowing your location, knowing your ecoregion, that can be very helpful when deciding uh, what plants are native to your area. Now, I love the USDA plants website. This is a phenomenal website. Um, if you have a plant and you're like, I don't know, I have no idea. It said it was native to Kentucky, but I, I don't know if that's native to my particular region or go on the USDA plants website. You can search by scientific name or common name, and then we'll give you a county by county breakdown of where that plant is native. Um, so this is lupin, uh, a species I love, but it really doesn't do too well in DC because it, I zoomed in a little too close on this screenshot, but it really likes to be up a little bit further north. Um, and I'm gonna go back. You can see it follows, it follows the coast a little bit. Um, it follows the, the ecoregions, not state borders so much. All right, seed zones. This is really more important for growers, people who are purchasing large amounts of seeds, growing them and then selling them. Um, it's a way to determine where it's safe to transfer seeds from. But the principle does apply to if you're purchasing from a garden center that's not near you. Um, I had someone ask if cattails are native. There, There is a native variety of cattail. Um, and they were like, great, I brought some down from Maine with me. And I'm going to put them in my rain garden. That is not native. That's from Maine. <laughs> um, I'm sure you've heard the, you know, don't transport firewood. It's the exact same principle if you're purchasing plants. There are insects in that. Uh, there's, it's a species that's not native to, or it's a plant that is not native to your region if you're transporting it from a ridiculous distance. Um, if you're getting from somewhere, you know, driving distance from you, don't worry about it. But if you're traveling somewhere and you're trying to bring back, plant, bring back plants, it's not going to be safe. All right. Now that you're thoroughly sold on native plants, you know how to identify what a native plant is. You know what we're talking about when we say native. Um, we're ready to use them. So here in DC, we have the River Smart Homes program, which uses native plants specifically in rain gardens and conservation landscaping to control stormwater runoff. Um, and this is a great picture of it on the left here. You can see all these downspouts coming off this house. Before the garden was installed, those would flow over the lawn into the street. From the street, it goes into the sewer, it overflows the sewer, or if it's a separated sewer system, 
it just takes all those chemicals straight from the sewer or straight from the street out into the bay. Either way, we're getting chemicals from the roof, we're getting chemicals from the lawn, we're getting chemicals from the street. It's all going into the local waterway. Here, we took those downspouts, we put them into a rain garden, which is a bowl-shaped garden designed to capture and infiltrate water. And now whenever it rains, the water from the roof goes right into the garden and it soaks in there. And these native plants can infiltrate, they can soak up um, the deep roots I talked about earlier. They're just gonna make sure that the soil remains loose. They're gonna break down into the soil below the clay layers, make sure water doesn't just stand there, make sure it's soaking in. Um, so less watering because the rain is gonna water these plants to a greater extent than it normally would. A lot less water going off your house into the street. Plus you have a gorgeous garden instead of just some lawn. Um, on the right here, you can see a grown in rain garden. Uh, this was just planted when this photo took, was taken. I like it because you can actually see the structure. But once it's grown in, it kind of just looks like a standard garden, um, just full of beautiful native plants. Another excellent use of native gardening is conservation landscaping. Um, this can be used to stabilize slopes, to reduce erosion, um, and really to cover up bare places in your yard. So in this case, this was just a bare slope. And every time it rained, water would come go rushing down here. It would take sediment with it. Again, that sediment just goes straight to the bay, um, clogging up the waterways, making that just a mess. So we put in some native landscaping. There's a bunch of ferns, some irises. I can't really see what the rest of this is, but <laughs> it is all native. Um, so these are going to put down roots. They're going to stabilize that slope, hold it all in place, prevent that erosion. It's good for the land, it's good for the water. The client gets a great garden. Um, so if you have a slope that you're seeing erosion on, put some native plants on it. Uh, annuals just are not gonna do the same job. Even a lot of non-natives are not gonna be able to stabilize the slope in the same way that a native garden can. All right, native meadows. I'm gonna hand it over to Laura for this one. Yeah, so meadows are also a really great practice um, to utilize native plants a little bit differently than um, a rain garden or conservation landscaping. Meadows are typically made up of a combination of um, native wildflowers as well as grasses. Um, they can be planted in two varieties, more of a, a cool season meadow that is really going to shine um, and look its best in our colder months versus a warm season meadow. Um, which is what's pictured here. So you can get a lot of vibrancy and color um, in these areas. And meadows can be a really great alternative, especially if you're looking to fill um, a larger area. So rain gardens um, and conservation landscaping can vary in size, um, are really good in residential applications. Meadows, you can also utilize um, residential or other applications. Um, they can be a lot larger, even acres in size, but have that really similar um, kind of stormwater value and functionality because of their uh, deep rooted native plants. And they also provide a lot of really great habitat um, and food sources for native wildlife as well. Thanks, Laura. Um, and even if you don't have a massive campus to plant a native meadow on, you can do native meadows in small areas in your yard. Um, it's a lot less maintenance than a standard garden. Is that, that fair to say, Laura? It's fair to say, yeah. Okay. So um, <laughs> the main kind of idea with meadows is you're wanting to keep out any of the um, plants that are gonna creep up that, you know, sometimes people refer to as weeds, but it's any, you know, non-desired plant that's in that space. But other than that, um, typically it's kind of, you know, spot treating to remove um, those unwanted plants and then just mowing that area once or twice a year is really the bulk of the maintenance requirements for um, a native meadow. Plus, they're beautiful. All right. Do you all have native plants already? We've got another poll for you. Um, I want to know if you have plants, if you have no idea what's in your garden, if you know they're not native, that's okay. Um, or you don't have a garden. I know 
I lived in apartments for the longest time and I did a lot of landscaping, but didn't have a garden. Um, yeah. exciting we see a lot of people have some plants some natives or a full native garden um i do have a native garden but i also have a non-native garden so i've got a little bit of both um and i'm always excited when i see someone doesn't know what's in their garden because that's who the target audience is <laughs> um, All right. Very exciting. I'm going to hand it over to Beth now. Um, all right. Thanks, Jordan. Um, that was awesome. Uh, and it, I think that was a really good question because it is good to kind of know just where people are. And I think of gardening with native plants along a continuum. Um, when I started graduate school uh, in landscape design, I really didn't understand native plants very well. And um, I had a lot of non-natives in my garden and over time I've really transformed it. Um, so uh, you can do the same thing in your own um, spaces. So uh, I will skip my introduction and Jordan, you can go on to the first, the next slide. Thank you. Um, so I mentioned uh, that I'm a landscape designer by training, uh, but um, now I'm serving as the executive director of this fabulous organization. And our focus is really on training and education for landscape professionals. Um, and everything that we do at CCLC is built around um, this little book uh, called The Eight Essential Elements of Conservation Landscaping. Um, you can find it on Amazon, uh, you can buy it through our website, um, and you can also find a download on our website. Uh, if you don't find it right away, you can um, write to me and I'll point it to you. Um, this is a great primer on what it means to approach a design landscape from a conservation perspective. And a big part of what we do in CCLC uh, is our focus on using um, locally native plants uh, to add wildlife habitat and um, benefits to stormwater practices across the Bay region. Uh, next slide, Jordan. And our signature program is called the Chesapeake Bay Landscape Professional Training. Uh, we really believe that landscape professionals have a unique opportunity to affect change uh, and to benefit local uh, watersheds, as well as uh, restoring and protecting the Chesapeake Bay, and um, along the way, uh, creating habitat and, and helping um, to restore some of the ecology of our fabulous Mid-Atlantic region. Um, so I'm not gonna give you too much information, but just know that if you do need help, uh, there is um, a group of trained landscape professionals. We have uh, about 750 across the Bay region who have been trained uh, in our CBLP program. Next slide. So I'm just gonna talk about um, some things to re reiterate uh, some of what Jordan talked about, but also kind of looking at how do we get these plants into our gardens um, and how do we decide what to use and um, how to put it all together. So I um, added this caveat, uh, which I think is actually a, a Frank Law Olmsted quote, um, that landscape design is really an old man's profession. And what I mean by that is that uh, we all have a lot to learn um, and uh, many of the choices that we make uh, are not always the best choice the first time around. So one of my personal goals as a designer was um, trying to help people prevent or, or um, not make a lot of the same mistakes that I made as a gardener. Um, so the more that you can learn, um, study, read, and look, um, you know, walk, walk your neighborhood, uh, look for native plants, visit public gardens that have great native gardens. Um, you can really learn a lot uh, to benefit your own landscaping. Next slide. So just to go backwards a little and reiterate what Jordan's already talked about, 
Um, so this is how we um, define a native plant species. Um, a native plant is one that occurs within a natural range and in particular habitats where over the course of time, those plants have adapted to the physical conditions and they've co-evolved with other species that live there. So um, this little graphic uh, shows our native plant um, that is co-evolved in certain soil conditions uh, with different um, plants who might eat them or insects who need the plants for energy. Um, also, the climate is very important uh, for native uh, species and pollinators and seed dispersers. Plants really rely uh, on all of those um, other uh, animals in their environment. Next slide. So a non-native plant is just one who's evolved elsewhere. Um, its evolutionary history occurred elsewhere in other sites, other site conditions. Um, it also includes GMOs, genetically modified organisms and hybrids. Um, we've talked a little bit about uh, all of us having some non-natives in our garden. Um, I think that's absolutely fine. Um, I do not advocate um, for a strict system of all natives. Uh, in my design practice, I usually strive to have about 75 to 80% natives in a garden, um, but no invasives. So I think that's the important thing is not all non-native plants are bad, um, but it's important to know which ones are the bad guys and keep those out of your landscape. Next slide. Um, so what's a cultivar? So um, we humans have uh, a great um, affinity for breeding plants. And um, there are lots of different characteristics and traits uh, that we have bred plants for. So sometimes you will see uh, native plants and they have a name after the name of the, of the species itself. And those, uh, usually it's in a single quote, um, mark, and that will be your indicator that you're looking at a cultivar. Uh, next slide. Um, so here's just a couple of my favorite examples uh, that I used a lot in my practice. Uh, Virginia Sweet Spire, Little Henry. Um, there are also a bajillion echinaceas. Um, Kim's knee high is one uh, in which the um, flower shape and color are very similar to the straight species, but it's very short diminutive kind of um, plant that doesn't tend to flop over a lot. Um, the plant you see in the photograph is Roos aromatica rolo. Um, that is a fragrant sumac that is um, bred to be very low and spreading. It's great on slopes, um, side slopes and berms of uh, stormwater BMPs, uh, as well as if you have a really steep um, backyard and you don't know what to plant there. Uh, it will take sun, it will take shade, uh, wet, dry. It's a great, really hardy plant. Um, so why do we like these cultivars? What, what is the point of all of these breeding programs? Um, well, uh, if you are working in a very small landscape, um, you will find that many cultivars fit better. Um, they are just bred to be more compact. Um, they may be bred not to be too floppy, uh, and they will... Um, be more aesthetically pleasing to a lot of folks who are um, putting in plants in a small landscape. Um, in addition, we have bred them to have different colors that we like. Um, all the variety of the rainbow. Uh, and I will just say that um, right now there's a lot of research going on in this field, um, especially as uh, these um, Bread cultivars relate to pollinators and um, whether pollinators know that it's their computer or not. Um, so a couple of things to be really careful about when you're selecting cultivars. Uh, I always um, try to avoid any plants uh, that have an altered flower shape um, because then the pollinators literally cannot get into the flower. Um, and also, as Jordan said, that leaf color is really important. Um, pollinators get very disoriented if they don't see the plant, um, the color that they recognize. So uh, there is a lot of research ongoing about this and um, I would encourage you to just pay attention. All right, uh, next slide. Um, so one of the um, things that we teach in our, all of our programs for landscape professionals is this concept of green mulch. 
Um, in America, we have a lot of brown mulch in our gardens, and uh, we all have sort of this cultural proclivity for um, fresh mulch put down in the spring. Um, what we really try to emphasize is reducing a reliance on um, shredded mulches and instead um, promoting uh, densely planted native species. So uh, these plants, um, when covering the ground, actually will help crowd out any um, invasives and uh, they will also reduce the need for the cost of added mulch. And um, obviously uh, you can also end up with a really beautiful aesthetic. Next slide. So right plant, right place. Um, I wish that I had a magic wand and I could convey to all of you the knowledge of how to choose the right plant for the right place. But it is, as I said, something that is learned over um, sometimes long periods of time. And uh, I encourage you to dig into this topic. Um, but it's really important to look at all of your different site conditions before you decide what plants are going in there. Um, this is a garden that I designed in Silver Spring, Maryland, um, which is also where I live. And uh, this is Carex Pennsylvanica, Pennsylvania sedge in the foreground. Um, and this was replacing uh, a lawn um, in a very shady backyard. Um, the shade there is actually cast by some white pines that are just outside the property. Uh, so it's quite um, quite shady there, and uh, then the background is uh, fully layered planting of native shrubs and all native perennials and ferns. Next slide. All right, so Jordan shared with me um, some of these great plants that I'm just going to flip through these pretty quickly for you. Um, this is definitely a favorite. Uh, there are lots of different rudecia. Um, a number of them are native to our region. There are also some that are uh, native uh, to the Midwest and um, beyond. Uh, so um, this is a great plant for full sun. Um, it is really good in lean soils. So um, you don't need to feel like you want to feed or um, give compost to this plant. It's really good for meadow plantings um, and uh, is very nice for holding the soil. Next. Um, bee balm is another favorite um, for meadow plantings. Um, there are several different species of Monarda that um, do very well in our region. Um, again, uh, this is just a brilliant plant for pollinators. You can see those bright red flowers. Um, pollinators, hummingbirds also really are quite fond of bee balms. Next, um, moss phlox. Uh, I grow this on a slope in my front yard, um, sort of spilling over a stone wall. Uh, it's kind of an old fashioned, uh, I think of it as a grandmother plant, um, but it's just spectacular in the spring. Um, it uh, prefers uh, full sun and does well in those kind of dry, um, dry soils uh, and um, is not, um, reg not made of everybody everywhere in the Bay, but uh, um, you can find them creeping over rocks in various quarters. All right, next. Um, hibiscus is a great plant for moist soils. Uh, I think um, if you are living along a shoreline or if you have kind of um, soggy, soggy soil, um, these do well in a rain garden. Um, they're quite tall, so make sure that you give them ample space, um, but that's a beautiful plant for layering in a garden uh, and has that kind of mid-summer color pop. Next. And a couple of um, shady perennials, uh, Jordan already mentioned the white turtle head. Um, this is a great plant for the Baltimore checker spot. Uh, I grow it in um, part shade uh, under some oaks, but where the soil tends to be very soft. Uh, next, um, bleeding heart is another lovely spring ephemeral. Um, there are several different bleeding heart species. Um, the Dicentra exemia is the native. Um, and you can tell that these little heart-shaped flowers are a little bit different from the fat heart-shaped shaped flowers, which is not a native. Um, so um, always good to keep an eye out for which one is actually uh, from your area. Next, um, this is probably my favorite plant du jour. Um, in fact, uh, the CCLC blog, uh, which is called Gathering, um, this uh, week we have a guest post from David Hirschman who talks about Pacara 
Um, this plant, uh, I've used it a lot in rain gardens. Um, I grow it on a north facing slope uh, under oak trees where I didn't at all think it was going to do well, um, but it's, it's very happy in sun or shade and um, wet or dry. Um, those little yellow flowers are just a breath of sunshine in the spring. Um, and once they die back, then you have that luscious green foliage that persists through the season. Next, um, foam flower, another great woodland native, um, spring blooming as many of them are, uh, and um, is very nice. Uh, makes a, a real carpet mosaic. Um, many of them, uh, the native uh, straight species, there's lots of cultivars, but um, the straight species also just has beautiful um, patterning on its leaves. And when the flowers die back, you keep those leaves through the growing season. All right. Um, I know you're not going to get all of this, but we're going to send you the slides. Um, I think it's just important to mention that when you're looking for uh, an ecologically diverse and rich plant palette, um, you do wanna make sure that you've got layering. So we're not just looking at the ground plane. Um, you do want the woody plants, shrubs, and uh, next slide is a few trees, uh, which are my favorites for um, our region. I um, highlighted there uh, the oak. Um, many of our oaks are in decline. Uh, if you live in the suburban Washington area, we are blessed with a wealth of mature oak trees. Many of them are failing, they're aging, and um, people are not replanting them. So please, if you have the space uh, for an oak tree, they're probably um, at the very top of the plant list in terms of richness uh, that they provide for our wildlife. Next. All right, so just a couple of um, books that I love. Um, I, I cannot get enough. Uh, there's a couple here that are new, um, some that are some oldies. Uh, I highlighted Doug Ptolemy's work here. Um, many of you no doubt are familiar with uh, Doug's writing already. He has a new book uh, just out, um, or maybe not quite out on Oaks. Uh, but this book, Bringing Nature Home, I think, um, for me and for my clients, this book was really earth change or earth shattering, um, life changing. Uh, this is the book that helps lay people really understand that um, they can play an important role in our ecology and in um, sustaining wildlife by putting these plants in your own backyard. All right, next. Um, so this is a, a, we call these our safari cards. Um, this is developed for landscape professionals, um, but if you are a professional or if you are um, going to be uh, putting in stormwater practices into your home landscape, then I would really um, recommend that you take a look at this. Uh, these are our top plants for stormwater BMPs uh, that we know do well in our region. Um, so uh, these are kind of laminated flip cards uh, that you can find on our website. And next. I'm actually gonna jump in here and say oh, yeah. that I have yeah. a copy of the Safari cards. And if I'm on the phone with someone, they're like asking for a recommendation and you know how sometimes you just blank, you know all the information, but it's just nothing there. Yeah. I pull this out every time I flip through up. Oh, yep, here we go, here we go. It's a great example, amazing resource. Strongly awesome. Recommend. Thank you. I'm so we've gotten really good feedback on it. And it was something that I had wanted to do for a long time. So we were excited that we finally um, got this out uh, to make it available. Um, all right. Uh, so this is um, the Alliance's fabulous website, uh, nativeplantcenter.net. Um, and uh, we recommend this very highly to professionals. Uh, it's a beautiful uh, database with lots of nice photos. You can search for uh, what you need, um, and uh, it's a really good tool. And next, um, so a couple of other resources for you. Our website is at the bottom there. Um, that link will actually take you directly to our professional directory. So you can help if you're looking for a landscape professional to help design, install, or maintain your garden, um, you can find them there. Uh, I love this choosenatives.org website. Um, it's a sort of clearinghouse for native plant nurseries. Um, we 
we decided very early on that we were not going to maintain a repository of information about native nurseries because it's changing so quickly. Um, but I think this site does a very good job of doing that. Um, next. And if you are a professional and you're interested uh, in digging in a bit more deeply, uh, we are offering a workshop in July, uh, which is all about working with native plant growers to source the plants that you need for your projects. Um, we have two guests, Amy Hyland and Sam Hoadley, um, joining us from Mount Cuba Center. Um, by the way, if you have never been to Mount Cuba and you happen to be in Delaware, uh, they're just outside the Bay Watershed, um, but it's an amazing, a place to visit. And uh, Leslie Cario, who's a horticulturist, will be with us and we'll have, I think we have three or four native growers from Virginia, Maryland, and Pennsylvania. And next, uh, and this is, um, this is the Bible upon which the uh, nativeplantcenter.net website is based. Uh, we, this is a very old reference. Uh, it has lousy pictures, but it is chock full of great information. Um, if you can put your hands on a copy, I highly recommend it. Um, it is a free publication that is out of print. Um, don't pay $100 for it on Amazon, um, but look around, ask around, um, see if you can put your hands on a copy. Uh, it's a great, great thing to have on your desk. I think we have this linked in the chat too, if you want to. Yes, and you can, yeah, absolutely, you can um, access it online and print your own, um, or at least just archive it on your bookmarks. And this is the resource we provide to all of our contractors for the River Smart Homes program. If they are, they have questions about what is native, there's some, you know, some question about that. We say, check with this first. Um, and we're willing to go with whatever that says. Yeah. Awesome. I think that's it. Yeah, so there's my email. Um, you guys feel free to reach out to me. Um, I'm, we're also, I think we're happy to take any questions. And you've got just a couple more, Jordan. Yeah. Um, if you're interested in hearing more of me talk or more of Beth's talk, we have <laughs> the Native Plant Narratives video series, the series that Laura and I have been putting together uh, geared towards homeowners who maybe don't know a ton about native plants. We're just kind of going through the basics, highlighting specific species. Um, we had Beth out as a guest speaker for one, had a lot of fun uh, going through a beautiful garden, just kind of talking about the different plants there. Um, so if you're interested in watching videos about native plants, check out Native Plant Narratives. Um, that can be found on the Alliance's website. You can also sign up for the Alliance for the Bay's newsletter. Um, if you love the native plant narratives and you want to know when the next one comes out, the newsletter will tell you if you're interested in, you know, finding out what we're up to, um, what the Alliance is doing. We've got great blog posts, very informative information. Um, it's a great resource, great newsletter to be on. So that is all I have. Thank you so much. Um, I did see in the chat a couple people mentioned that they have uh, bayscapes and rain gardens in DC. They were asking about plants. I think we, uh, we went over a couple different great options for basecapes and rain gardens. Were there questions in the chat that we missed? Yeah, Jordan and Beth, I wanted to draw your attention to, um, it wasn't a question, more of a comment about, um, I think it was Drew Brown who had noted um, about planning, you know, local natives to your eco region, but also noted um, genetic diversity from Southern population. Um, and how those plants could help buffer effects of climate change. So I was wondering if either of you could speak to that because I thought that was a really interesting comment that he brought up. That is a great, um, thanks Drew for, for mentioning that. Um, I, I wish there were like, there was definitive information on this. I feel like it's very much still evolving. Um, we will have uh, at our conference in December, we have someone from EPA who's a scientist who's actually looking at how climate change is impacting uh, native plant populations. And um, I think certainly we can see that um, our, uh, our plant hardiness zones are shifting. Um, some plants that used to do well here in the DC area are not doing as well now um, just because of the sustained heat and especially like nighttime temperatures. A lot of plants rely on um, cooling at night 
um, to regenerate and restore themselves. And when we have elevated prolonged temperatures, they don't get that. So um, it's a really good question. I don't have um, real answers for you, but I would just say um, be aware of that. And certainly it's something to think about when you're choosing plants. You know, you may not want to choose plants that are at the um, already at the southern end of their range. And um, I think sugar maple is an example that we talk about a lot in our training. Um, a lot of people in Maryland um, grew up with sugar maples tapping trees in their backyard kind of thing. And um, that is a range that is pushing northward up here. Um, I think just anecdotally, uh, I see it with rhododendrons. Um, I have a gigantic, probably a 60 year old rhododendron um, outside my side door. Uh, I would not, it's, it's beautiful, it's well established, it does fine, um, but I cannot get new ones to grow uh, here in suburban Maryland. So um, there's a lot of things like that uh, that we just should be mindful of. Especially when talking about trees and shrubs that are gonna last a long time. Some of these perennials, it's not as long lasting. So the effects of climate change of the changing climate, you know, where we are now is going to be okay for them, but where we will be in 50 years, that's going to impact the trees we're planting uh, heavily. Yeah, that's a, a really great comment and definitely something we're, <laughs> we're all learning about. Um, we had a question about green mulch in the winter. Beth, you want to take that one? Yeah, sure. Um, I, I would say that it depends uh, on what the plants are. Um, I'm a big advocate for not cutting down um, perennial herbaceous plants uh, until the end of winter. Um, usually the first season that things, herbaceous plants are in the ground, um, they tend to be kind of weak and floppy. So they may not look good that first winter and you may want to cut them in November. Um, but for the most part, we really want to leave those because that's precious habitat um, for all kinds of insects and small mammals and even birds um, really can, can overwinter in those herbaceous plants. Um, so I think there's tremendous beauty in brown um, stalks. Uh, they can have interesting uh, sort of ice patterns forming on them um, and, and a lot of actual color even in brown foliage. So um, I think that part of it is a changing aesthetic. Um, some of us grew up with clipped boxwood and, um, and a lot of turf grass, and it's a very different aesthetic to have a native garden um, that might be a bit tall uh, overwintering. Um, and there are some plants that also are evergreen or semi-evergreen uh, that if you really want some green in there, um, you can, can look for some of those. Uh, and, um, uh, I think certainly um, some shrubs as well will give you more structure if you are layering in a planting. Obviously, if it's a meadow, it's going to be just spacious plants, but um, you can sort of look for structure and pattern and texture even in the winter. Yeah, there's some really fun options out there for natives that are, give you interest, winter interest. I mean, red twig dogwood is one I always talk about. Um, we did a recent native plant narrative on red twig, red twig dogwood. So if you're interested in that, you can definitely go check that out. But yeah, and like I said, leaving up stalks is an excellent resource. Um, you often see birds picking at those old stalks from the, the echinacea or the black eyed suits and getting the seeds out of them, you know, midwinter when there really isn't a lot else, they do rely on the plants, you know, they would expect that to be in a, in a naturally occurring environment. Those stalks are just staying up until, until they fall down. Um, yeah, good question. Oh, we have a question about why oaks are dying off. Is that just climate change, Beth? Um, I don't think that people know. So um, there are, you know, in the West, there's a, um, there's, I think it's a fungal disease called sudden oak mm. death, sudden oak, but I don't think we have that here. Um, I think that's a West Coast issue. 
Um, there was a season about, I think about three years ago where we had um, just torrential amounts of rain um, on the heels of some pretty significant drought. And I know that there was some speculation around the DC area that the oaks did not weather well um, those two extremes in precipitation to go from like severe drought to a deluge. Um, uh, I know that I lost a scarlet oak in the rain year and it was in an area where it was getting a lot of water. Um, I know that um, there's some folks around, Rob, Rod Simons is one, Simmons Simons uh, is one who's um, really been kind of leading some experts looking at uh, the oak deaths. Um, and there's also just a certain amount of their aging, you know, um, a, a lot of our cities planted oaks in the 20s and 30s and 40s, and those are just getting, um, they're just getting old, you know, and they're stressed because many of them are now in urban or, or heavily suburbanized areas, so they're not getting enough water, um, there's a lot of pollution, and, um, you know, it's just a stressful existence. Um, to answer the question about what the shrub that was recommended for hilly areas, I believe that was fragrant sumac, uh, Rus aromatica. Uh, Rus aromatica, grow low. I'll put it in the chat. Yeah, that's a, all of the sumacs are great plants and there's a ton of different really cool varieties out there. Um, but the, the fragrant one, the grow low is a nice, well-contained option um, if you're not looking for something that's going to like get as big as like the staghorn sumac. Um, it grows out instead of up. So it will, a single shrub will get to be about eight feet in diameter, but it's only about 18 inches tall. And if you have them in enough sun, they're spectacular in the fall. They have just beautiful fall foliage. And they do have the, um, the leaf is actually when it's crushed, it's aromatic. Or if you happen to be driving a pack of them around in your car, um, <laughs> they, they smell great. Then Jordan, we have one other question that came in the question, uh, the Q&A box. The question is, is if you guys have experience or can think of a polite way to ask your neighbors and or townships to remove English ivy and oriental bittersweet off large native trees in yards and parks. Is this something that you guys have experienced with? I really think that's a matter of understanding. Um, the owner of the property needs to understand that they are going to lose the tree if they don't remove the ivy. Um, and I know a lot of people like English ivy. It is on my top five least favorite plants list, but um, some people, they like that look. Um, I, I don't have a good answer for how to convince a neighbor to remove that. Um, I don't know if that's there. No, I think you're right, Jordan. I mean, I think it's about education. People don't understand that a little vine can choke a big, huge, strong tree to death. Um, so, and what we advocate um, is not pulling them down because you can really damage the bark of the tree, the, especially ivy um, tends to, it sticks. Um, so if you just cut about two feet of the ivy off the base of the tree and then pull it back, remove the roots of the ivy at the base of the tree, um, the only issue with that is then the ivy dies and it looks brown. It will eventually fall off, but there's a short time where it doesn't look great. Um, but I don't think people understand like the damage that it can do. And, and many of them, when they do understand that, you know, will do the right thing. Thank you. That was the last question I have on my end. All right. Well, this has been fun. Um, thank you, Beth, so much for joining us. Sure. Uh, I, always love an opportunity to talk native plants with you. Um, and please check out CCLC, the CBLP course that Beth mentioned earlier. Uh, that was one I was able to take. Um, and a lot of the slides I put in here are just taken straight from the information I learned at that course. It's a, a great resource. Um, yeah. Thank you.
It's great to see you guys. Thank you, Beth and Jordan, for sharing your knowledge and your experience and clearly your passion for native plants today. We really appreciate it. We appreciate everybody joining us today. We did record today's session and we will make this available. We'll follow up with the slides from today's presentation along with links to all the resources that were also shared. And just a reminder um, that we have a $25,000 match donation to the Alliance this summer. And if you make a donation to us, we will match that one-to-one -one, um, as we're looking ahead to our next 50 years of work. We hope you'll contribute and help keep us focused on bringing together the communities, companies, and conservationists to restore the lands and waters of our Chesapeake Bay watershed. So thank you, everybody. We hope you'll join us for future Breakfast on the Bay conversations and have a wonderful rest of your week. Thanks all. Bye, everybody.